Welcome to Intangibles, a podcast about the traits, behaviors, and qualities that entrepreneurs can cultivate to help be successful. This podcast is created by Andeseed Ventures, an enterprise-focused seed stage venture firm in New York City. You can find us at www.antecedent.vc. I'm your host, Steve Berg. This season is brought to you by Denton's Venture Technology Group at dentonsventurebeyond.com. Operating as a boutique within the world's largest law firm, the Venture Technology Group runs with hard-charging tech entrepreneurs to drive growth through strategic business, finance, and legal advice from Silicon Valley and New York to London, Berlin, Hong Kong, and beyond. Learn more at dentonsventurebeyond.com. Today's topic is curiosity. You may be wondering why I've chosen this topic, and if so, you're already off to a good start. Actually, curiosity is correlated with intelligence and creativity and actually gives rise to innovation. In my experience, entrepreneurs are always churning on things, looking at things from different angles and asking questions. So I thought it made sense to speak with someone who has spent some time studying curiosity in all its forms and learn a little more about it. My guest today, Ian Leslie, is an author and speaker who lives in London. He's written a number of books about ideas, culture, and politics. Today, I'm quizzing him on the book he put out at the end of 2015, aptly called Curious. Hi, Ian. Thanks for taking the time today. What have I left out of your introduction that I should not have? Hi, Steve, uh, and thank you for, for having me on. Uh, well, um, I am, uh, as you say, I'm a writer. I'm based in London, England, and uh, my first career was in advertising and marketing, and I still uh, work as a consultant in that field. Um, but now I spend at least half my time writing. I've written a couple of books. One of them was about lying. Uh, and the most recent one, as you say, is about curiosity. So I like to sort of take a human trait and look at it in the round, uh, talking to lots of experts and scientists, uh, academics from various fields, practitioners, business people, and so on. Um, and uh, I also do journalism, so I write for The Economist, Financial Times, and a few others. And I basically kind of choose a topic that I'm interested in and then write uh, a, an in-depth piece about it. So really, I sort of set up my life around curiosity. And that's, that's partly why I, I decided to choose that topic for my, for my book. One of the things I particularly liked about that book is that it's so chock full of like the equivalent of case studies or examples, anecdotes, stories. So I'm sure you've got a bunch of great ones to relate for us today. Sure. Yeah. I mean, um, I, I wanted it to be a fascinating, fun resource. So I, on every page, I hope there's, there's something to, to get your teeth into. All right. Let's start with the obvious. Can you give a working definition of curiosity and some parameters around it um, as it relates to business? Sure. Um, the most simple and uh, basic definition of curiosity is uh, uh, was coined by Aristotle. He said, curiosity is the desire to know. Um, and in fact, what he meant by that was the the desire to know over and above what you need to know. OK, so uh, a, a human being needs to know certain things in order to survive, get by, survive in his or her environment. But when you start looking up at the stars and, and, and wondering why, um, when you start asking questions that you don't need to ask, that's that's when you're you're curious. So it's this sort of innate drive to gather new information, uh, ask questions and accumulate knowledge over and above what's absolutely necessary. Um, and it relates to business in, in a few ways. Uh, first of all, uh, as businesses get more complex, workers, people who work in business, you know, they need sort of deeper knowledge and more cognitive skills. And in order to learn those skills and get that knowledge, you need to have your sort of internal engine working, your intellectual engine working, kind of gathering knowledge uh, over and above what you what you have to know in order to to do the job, um, and secondly, that's from the point of view of the individual. Secondly, corporate cultures can be curious or incurious. So companies as a whole, I think, can be open to new information and ideas and insights, or closed, just basically going through the same processes over and over. And obviously, I think it's better to be a curious company, um, but that's that's sometimes easier said than done. So that would be a practical definition. I understand that there's also a scientific definition. I think cognitive scientists have identified three types of curiosity. Is that correct? 
That's right. So, so broadly speaking, uh, uh, I talk about three types of curiosity in the book, and that based on the uh, the research literature, um, and the the most important uh, distinction is between diversive and epistemic curiosity. Okay, so they're slightly technical terms, but the they're pretty uh, simple to understand. So diversive curiosity is where curiosity begins. It is the desire for novel information, for new information. Um, it's that sort of uh, innate uh, urge to uh, see what's under that rock, um, or what an equivalent would be to click on that link um, to say, hey, what's that? What's that shiny new thing? I need to know. I want to know. I just have that kind of, uh, that itch of curiosity, right? Epistemic curiosity is a slightly, uh, it's a sort of deeper and higher form of curiosity. So epistemic curiosity is more about the accumulation of knowledge. You know, sometimes say that epistemic curiosity is what diversive curiosity, uh, is what happens when diversive curiosity grows up. Okay, so so if you were just practicing diversive curiosity, you'd be constantly diverted by every new question that kind of popped into your head or, or came into your, your path. And you'd end up in this kind of futile search for, for always for, for the new thing. What epistemic curiosity does is it helps you build that into knowledge. So, you know, a, a, a scientist who decides that uh, she is going to pursue uh, quantum physics as her, her life's work has a very sort of profound, deep, form of, of epistemic curiosity. But you could have epistemic curiosity about anything, right? It could be about your, the particular field of business you work in. Uh, it could be about sports. But it's this desire to, to really become knowledgeable in, uh, uh, about a certain field. And then empathic curiosity is a third type of curiosity. It's slightly different, it's slightly to the side of, of those two, because those there are kind of forms of intellectual curiosity. Empathic curiosity is more about personal curiosity, curiosity about other people. Okay, so empathic curiosity is when I want to know what it's like to be you or what it's like to be another person. What's that person thinking? What's that person feeling? Um, so obviously that's related to intellectual curiosity, but it's slightly different from the other two. So if I understand you right, epistemic is essentially diversive plus focus. And ep empathetic is curiosity around feelings and emotions. Yeah, I think that's a, a, pretty, a pretty good way to, to put it. Epistemic curiosity is uh, exactly, it requires focus. Um, it requires effort um, and, and sort of application and concentration, right? So, so diversive curiosity almost uh, is something that happens to you. OK, you, you, you know that we, we talk about being seized by curiosity um, it's, and it's almost like a physical reaction. Sometimes you just kind of, uh, well, you know, that, that, that metaphor of the itch of curiosity is, is very uh, ingrained in the way we, we think and feel about it. Um, epistemic curiosity is when you take that urge and, and you kind of sit down and you think, I'm going to I'm going to learn about this. Um, uh, and that might be reading a book. Uh, it might be uh, reading research, uh, reading a paper. It, it might be sitting down with somebody who knows uh, stuff about the, what you want to know and, and kind of and pulling out of information out of them. And obviously that's when it overlaps with, with empath empathic curiosity. So related to epistemic curiosity, I think you're referring to something called need for cognition or NFC. Is, is, is that correct? Yeah, need for cognition. Um, is uh, it's, it's the closest that scientists have got to um, a way of actually measuring curiosity. Uh, and you can take uh, a test for, for, for NFC. There's a, a simplified form of it in my book. Um, but a, a need for cognition is um, a measure of how much you take satisfaction or pleasure in, in complex thinking. So if you're the kind of person who is, to use a really obvious example, if you're the kind of person who is drawn to, to crosswords, then you probably have a, a higher NFC, uh, NFC than, than people who don't. Um, if you're the kind of person who, when they see a really complex problem in a field they're interested in, gets really excited, you know, or, 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 or when, they, when they're faced with a challenge of understanding something difficult to understand, I think I really want to meet that challenge, then you are high in, in NFC. So people who are high in, in 
NFC are people who like to kind of take the long way around intellectually. You know, they're not satisfied with the simplest way to understanding uh, understand something or the shortcut. Um, they might they might kind of take satisfaction in simplicity in other ways, but when it comes to thinking, they like it to be uh, as <laughs> as hard as possible. So there's a spectrum, right? So that means that you know you could look at me and say that you know my NFC is X. I don't know some coefficient. And you could compare that to you and say, well, my NFC is Y, and therefore you can measure me as a more curious person. That's right. Yeah. Um, so I always like to ask the nature versus nurture question. So how much of curiosity is learned and how much is innate? I mean, am I just born less curious than you? Yeah. I mean, it's a really good question. And it's there isn't really a definitive answer to this yet, um, partly because it's really – it's kind of hard for, for psychologists to agree what curiosity is, um, partly or, or at least how to measure it, because uh, it depends so much on the information that's presented to somebody at any one time, how much information they, they have about something. Um, so I, I would say, you know, genetically or biologically, it's it correlates with one of the big five personality traits of openness, right? So, so openness to to to, to new information, uh, to new experiences, um, is obviously very closely related to to curiosity. Um, but you know, curiosity depends on what what one of the major psychologists who study it has, has called the information gap. The information gap means when you have a little bit of information, but you know that you don't know everything that's when you have the hunger for more. Um, and this psychologist's uh, point, he was called George Lowenstein. Lowenstein's point was that curiosity doesn't happen in a vacuum. If you don't know anything about a particular subject, then you're unlikely to be curious about it. If you know a little, uh, sorry, if you know everything about it, then you're also unlikely to be curious because you know everything. If you know a little about it and you know that you don't know everything, that's when curiosity happens. So curio curiosity happens in that information gap when you know a little, but but you know you don't know everything and you need, you need to know more. Um, you said something that I'm particularly curious about. Ha, didn't mean that. Um, <laughs> it's correlated with intelligence and creativity. So is there empirical research? Yeah, there, there's some empirical research showing that, it, that there are correlations with, with intelligence and creativity. I mean, intelligence cor correlates with a lot of things, a lot of positive traits. So in a way, that's not so, so interesting. Um, but there is plenty uh, of other kinds of evidence showing that, that curiosity relates to, to creativity. And that shouldn't be a surprise. I mean, w one of the... the well, I would say the wellspring of, of creativity is actually curiosity. Um, as somebody uh, put it to me, um, before you can say why not, you, you start with why, right? You, you start saying, well, why do things have to be like this? Um, and then you start imagining different possibilities. Um, and the other point about the relationship between curiosity and creativity is that curiosity, epistemic curiosity, it means that you're gathering lots of different knowledge about different things over the course of your lifetime. And that knowledge gets kind of absorbed into your long-term memory. Um, and that makes, that gives you much more fertile soil uh, to make new connections between things. And, and creativity, really one way of defining it is uh, new connections between different parts of uh, different bits of information, you, you know, connections that haven't been made before that form a new new idea. Um, and so, you know, when you look at great artists or, or great creative business people, uh, you often find that they draw inspiration from unexpected places, and that's because they are naturally curious people who've gathered these bits of, of information, like a magpie kind of putting together a nest over time. Um, and then when they're not even thinking about it, when they're daydreaming or sleeping or going for a walk, uh, that information kind of pops into their head in the form of a new idea. So as you were describing it, I immediately thought of creativity as this deconstruction of an idea that already exists, right? And the only way you can deconstruct it is to simply ask enough questions about it, which is, you know, curiosity being the train that allows creativity um, as a function of deconstruction. So um, 
to me, that's a huge insight. Yeah, that's right. And and it was, it's also, yeah, it's also the mechanism by which you kind of gather the raw materials, which are, which then become formed into, into something new. So, I mean, I think in general, people would agree that curiosity is a good thing unless you're one of those cats. Um, but let's talk about why it's important from the perspective of, of founders and entrepreneurs who I um, expect will be listening. Can you think of any examples of how curiosity helped drive business success? Yeah, I mean, uh, in, in a sense, I think entrepreneurs are inherently curious because entre entrepreneurs are people who are more likely than the average person to to look at the world, to look at a particular part of the world and, and ask why, you know, well, why does it have to be like that? Um, wh why do cars need drivers? <laughs> you know, <laughs> whatever it is. Um, uh, and once you start asking why things are like, why things are as they are, uh, and you start deconstructing it, you start sort of, sort of taking apart, then you almost can't help but imagine new ways of putting it back together uh, and therefore coming up with new ideas, including a new idea for, for a business or, or, or a product or, or a service. So I think that's the first thing to say. Entrepreneurs are sort of uh, inherently curious people. Um, but then I think the challenge is to stay curious in, uh, as, as an individual um, and uh, in terms of the, the corporate culture, the company culture that you you create as your as your uh, your entity grows, um, and uh, yeah, so so that's a kind of challenge that I explore in my book, both from a personal perspective and a kind of a corporate or collective perspective. So one thing I didn't tell people, um, so the book is titled Curious, but the rest of the title is Why Your Future Depends on It. And I think that yep. the why your future depends on it part is particularly interesting, right? Because it is that curiosity that is the engine that drives progress. Exactly, exactly. I mean, um, well, it, why your future depends on it, I, I, it's a sort of a bit of a finger wagging subtitle. But, but basically I'm saying, unless you read the book, you don't have a future. Uh, no, I'm not really saying that. Um, I, I talk in the book, I give a kind of brief survey of, of how the reputation of curiosity has uh, waned and waxed o over the last few centuries. Um, what's really interesting is that it's only it's relatively recently in human, uh, in sort of Western society, that curiosity has been regarded as a, as a positive trait. Um, for a long time, it was defined as uh, a vice by, by, by the church, something you really, you know, really quite um, uh, dangerous and sinful. And in any kind of uh, authoritarian society or very hierarchical society or indeed hierarchical organization, curiosity tends to be discouraged. Once you start to value innovation and new thinking and ideas and you start to think about society in terms of progress, then suddenly curiosity flips into a positive. Suddenly it's okay. It's good to ask questions, whereas before it was thought to be kind of disruptive of the established order. Um, so if you are if you're in a world where disruption, you know, is, is valued as you know entrepreneurs are, then curiosity is is seen as a a, a positive thing. Um, and yeah, so I, I think it's important to our future as as a society because if we're going to you know, innovate our way out of the, the many kind of problems that we face, then we're going to need a lot of various, cur very curious people coming together uh, to, in to, to come up with new solutions. Um, and I think it's important to, to you know, people, individuals in the workplace, because as business and as society gets more complex, the requirements for, for what you have to know to even get to first base in terms of competence in, uh, in, in computer science um, uh, or any kind of field related to, to uh, technology um, and other kind of business fields, then you, know, you, you need that kind of inherent desire to, to keep learn and keep learning uh, because otherwise you just get left behind. So, I mean, this raises a good point. I mean, can we actually teach individuals to be more curious? Can we cultivate a generation of people that, that we can count on to help us innovate out of some of these problems? I think so. I hope so. And that's partly why I wrote the book, because I just had the impression that 
people tend to think of curiosity as uh, a kind of inherent gift that you are born with. You know, we, we have this great idea that, that children are born curious and isn't that a, a wonderful thing? And uh, we're all kind of inherently ask, uh, questing and so on. Um, and to a large extent, that's true. But what it leaves out is that we very quickly get to the stage where we can pretty much do without curiosity if we want. So once we get to the stage where we have learned how to get along in our particular niche, our particular uh, society, or uh, in our particular job, where we kind of know the basic uh, cultural and professional routines that, that we need, then uh, it's quite easy to just then sort of take your foot off the gas, if you like, um, and stop having that drive to, to learn and ask questions and accumulate new knowledge. Because that takes effort and it takes focus and that's tiring, right? Um, so your curiosity can sort of wither and atrophy um, without you really noticing it. Um, and part of the reason I wrote the book was almost to say kind of, you know, let's wake up to the fact that that can happen and let's realize that it's a bad thing um, for you as an individual and for us as a, as a society. So, yeah, I, th I think there are ways to, to, to stay curious. I think one of them is just being aware of what I've just said, um, being aware that it's possible to become incurious almost without you noticing it. Um, another one is to, to not be afraid to ask questions. Um, of uh, people you know, uh, of people you don't know, anyone you, you think has something interesting to tell you, even people who you don't think have something interesting to tell you, ask them a question because you never know uh, what you're going to learn. And, you know, you have to recognize there are certain pressures on you, particularly in certain professional contexts, not to ask questions, right? So asking a question could be perceived as a form of weakness. You know, you think, well, I, if I'm going to ask this question, if I ask this question, somebody might say, well, why doesn't he know the answer? You know, what, it, 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 it's almost a kind of exposing act to to ask a question sometimes. Um, and I want people to kind of get over that. There's also the question of hierarchy sometimes in fix, you know, in, in companies or organizations with uh, uh, kind of strict hierarchies of power. People don't want to ask questions. It looks like they're kind of being disruptive. Um, I was talking to a, a CEO of, a, of an Asian uh, ad agency. Um, and he was saying that's a, that's a particular problem for us. We, we you know, we'd appreciate your advice on, on helping us create a, a more curious culture. Yeah, I was thinking that, it, that there's uh, some cultural aspects um, to that as well. Um, are there anything that, you know, well, the first thing I think is that if you're confident enough in your own self, then you don't feel as if asking a question shows weakness. Um, is there, but are there any other things that you can think of that actually feed your curiosity? Yeah. I mean, I, I, what I'd say to what you just said is I agree if you're confident enough in yourself. Um, but I think if you are a boss, you know, a founder, then it's also your responsibility to create an environment in which people have that confidence. Um, you know, I say that the, the two things that really kill curiosity are fear and complacency. Um, so, you know, the, the, the two opposite ends of the spectrum, uh, and you, you need to kind of create a culture where you're in the middle of that inverted you, right? Uh, if you, if your company is run on, on, is, a, is a culture where everybody's kind of really scared, uh, and, and in fear of their jobs all the time, they're much less likely to, to be asking questions or to, to be doing anything that isn't absolutely 100% related to the task at hand. Um, and that's when people stop asking new questions and when fresh thinking stops coming in the door. Um, but similarly, at the opposite end of the spectrum, if people are just uh, allowed to think that anything they do is pretty much okay and they can sit back and, and just kind of um, relax and if we just keep on doing what we're do doing, we're going to make money, uh, we're going to make a profit, it's all going to be fine. Then again, there's no incentive to ask uh, tough questions. There's no incentive to find out what's really going on in the consumer's mind uh, or, or, or what's the kind of next uh, technological innovation that's going to disrupt this, this category. Um, so, that, so those are the two things that, that kind of kill uh, curiosity. So I was thinking even a step further that good entrepreneurs should actually incent curiosity, right? We, we would much rather uh, compensate you for a dollar of 
revenue that comes from a new innovation than a dollar of revenue that comes from, you know, a thing that we thought of three years ago. Yeah. And, and you know, I don't know what the best way to to do that. Obviously, you know, Google, uh, I don't think they do this anymore, but they used to have, you know, certain uh, – they put aside time. Now, everybody had to put aside time in which they were allowed to do their own research and kind of follow their own their own interests. I mean, the, the slight danger with that is that it it becomes disconnected from the main corporate mission. You've got to strike this balance between giving people enough room to explore new questions and gather new information and insights uh, about something they're really interested in, and making sure that that connects to to what the company's mission is all about. Yeah, all too often that, that that thinking only comes when the company's back is to the wall, and usually by then it's too late. Um, you touched on the things that starve curiosity, and I think you touched on fear and complacency. Um, one, are there any other things that starve curiosity? And two, um, perhaps a little bit more about fear in particular. Yeah, I mean, I, I think another way, it's perhaps a slightly different spin on, on complacency, but habit uh, is a killer of, of curiosity. Mm. Um, you know, you, you need people to have uh, habits at work, kind of um, heuristics to, to help them to get by. Um, but once you start, once you start relying on those too much, um, then people kind of forget how to leave the beaten path. Um uh, you know, and I think if you look at Clayton Christensen's theory of of disruption, uh, he's basically talking about companies that have lost the habit of ask of being curious. Um, you know, uh, because they are making money so reliably, they stop asking questions about how uh, the consumer environment or, and, or, or the competitive environment or the technological environment is changing, um, and before they know it, a hungrier more curious uh, challenger has come up and 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 eaten their lunch. Yeah, so it's got to be, you know, from the top and from the beginning, ingrained in the corporate culture, as opposed to, you know, at the end when we're really stuck, um, you know, trying to pull a rabbit out of a hat. I think. I, I agree, and actually, at the end, yeah, I mean, in a way, at the end, when when you got your back against the wall. The, the danger is you absolutely shut down curiosity altogether. And you just say, you know, let's try the, state, the, th- the same thing that's failed the last 30 times over and over again. <laughs> you know, um, people get stuck in these kind of th- these loops. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it is you've got to build it into the, the core of, of your culture. Uh, but then you've got to check back, you know, <laughs> regular intervals and saying, are we too close to uh, a fear culture here, or are we too close to a complacency culture here? Are we in the sweet spot where people are incentivized to to ask new questions in a way that that, that relates to uh, to helping the companies uh, to, to helping the company thrive? So, kind of back on the negative side of things here, you, you suggested um, that our current environments, specifically access to more information via computers. Uh, or the internet actually hurt our curious nature. Um, to me, that's very counterintuitive because it's so much easier to ask a question and get an answer than it ever was. Um, I would think that people would be more inclined to want to do so. How, tell If you could explain, how is technology killing our curiosity? Okay, so um, it's doing both, right? So, so you're right. Um, uh, the way to think about technology uh, and the internet in relation to curiosity is that it's the best thing that ever happened to curiosity and the worst thing at the same time. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a quote in the book where uh, I can't remember who it is now, but somebody said that the internet is making smart people smarter and stupid people stupider. Right. I mean, that's a bit of a kind of, that's a funny, but slightly kind of crude characterization of, of What I'm saying, which is that if you are a strongly uh, curious, epistemically curious person and you consciously pursue your curiosity in the way that I advise people to to do uh, in the book, then, yeah, the Internet is the best thing that ever happened. Right. I mean, is you have this incredible access to to so much uh, knowledge, Um, uh, more than any human society has, has, has had before. 
Um, however, if you are if you are a bit lower in NFC, right? If you're a bit more cognitively lazy, and frankly, all of us are cognitively lazy at various points uh, in our lives, then the internet is also great because the internet enables that laziness, right? The internet gives you top line, instant answers to anything you want. Um, and that means that you don't have to dig beneath the bottom bottom line, right? You, you don't have to kind of search through several books and pick up all sorts of extraneous information along the way, which actually might turn out to be really useful later on. Um, you, you don't have time for a question to kind of settle and incubate and form and reform in your mind because, bam, you've got the answer. You just pull the phone out of your pocket. Right? You don't have to go and talk to several smart people to kind of pull, tease out a kind of interesting line of thought from them. Um, you can just get an argument off the shelf. You can get a, a piece of information off the shelf uh, anytime you want. So I would say if used properly, you know, in an epistemically curious way, it's the best thing. But I would say let's just be aware that it's also uh, uh, for, for, for more complacent or kind of lazier mindsets, it's it, it, it ex exacerbates that problem. Um, so it works at, at both ends of, of the scale, if you see what I mean. The other thing about it, of course, the more straightforward problem with it, um, it is that it's enormously entertaining and diverting um, and that you could, you could spend – your attention can be absorbed by things that are just uh, – that don't add anything to the sum of, of human knowledge. Um, there's a great uh, Reddit question an answer that I quote in the book, somebody had asked the question, what if somebody from 100 years ago came along today, uh, was transpl transplanted to the modern day? What would, what would be the thing that most amazed them? And the top answer to this question was, I have a device in my pocket uh, through which I can access the entirety of the world's information. And I use it to get into arguments with strangers and look at cats. And, you know, there's a lot of, it's funny, but it's also a profound truth about how we're using this amazing technology. Um, and although, you know, there's that old quote about curiosity killed the cat, uh, I sometimes say to people, the bigger danger now is that cats kill curiosity. I love the answer to this question because on one hand, you're saying that information is nearly disposable. Uh, on the other hand, you're saying that those with a high NFC are, you know, ever more stimulated to inquire. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so I talk about uh, a growing cognitive divide in the book, right? There's a kind of widening cognitive inequality in our society, right? And there are deep, deep social and economic divides and social and economic inequalities, which we're familiar with. But I think on top of that, the internet drives this kind of cognitive inequality because people who are high in NFC, people who practice epistemic curiosity are going to get better and better, you know, accumulate more and more knowledge and, and insight. And people who are not so high in NFC or allow themselves to become incurious will kind of spiral back the other way. So you'll see this kind of widening divide. Um, so, in fact, when I always thought that technology was this great, uh, you know, playing field leveler, in fact, it's magnifying some of the deficiencies that currently exist. I, I think so. I think that's the, the danger. Yeah. Whew. Okay. Um, so, I, I tend to like to be around curious people. Um, I like to invest in founders that have a healthy amount of curiosity. Obviously, um, curiosity has more positive impact than, than negative impact on success. So how do I spot these types of people? Um, I can't just look at their CV or education. I, you know, how do I draw out, you know, without actually giving them an, uh, an NFC test, you know, how curious they are? Yeah, giving them an NFC test might not be a bad idea, actually. Um, I would say... Have the, do they come to you with interesting questions, right? So, so there's always a stage in, in any interview where you say, have you got any questions for me? And I, I would bet that, that nine times out of ten, you know the questions they're going to ask, right? And, and it's a little bit, yeah, it's a little bit predictable. If they come to you with really interesting questions that show that they have thought about 
your business um, r rather more deeply than most people who, who come into the interview and have formulated some really interesting questions that that, that challenge you and throw new light on some of the problems you deal with, then that's a really good sign. Uh, I'd also say in the uh, you know, sort of extracurricular uh, part of the, uh, the interview process, do they show real enthusiasm um, and, and expertise in fields that aren't actually related to the job at hand. I mean, are they just geeks for historic for history, right? Um, are they all over the kind of latest developments in in genetics? Um, once you meet somebody who has th those kinds of interests and, and has accumulated a deep well of knowledge uh, in a field like that that isn't actually directly related to what they do, then that's a really really great sign because it shows that they have this kind of intrinsic hunger to learn by the way those conversations are by far more interesting to me than than the you know rote question about well what's the next step in the process um absolutely so, so, so and, and i think i mean in general also i found that um if you get some anecdotes about experiences these people have those anecdotes often reveal you know um, you know, inquisitiveness, uh, you know, you know, drive NFC, that kind of thing. So, yeah, I, I, I completely agree. And, and by the way, that's like my sly way of figuring out, uh, what founders to back. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. Well now you've, you've put it out there in the world that everybody will be, uh, reading up on something, something obscure before they come and meet you. Exactly. So how did the dinosaurs die? I, I, I don't yeah, know. Right. That, <laughs> I don't know if that's going to be, I don't know if that will uh, any longer be the good um, off topic uh, question. Yeah. Um, so before I end, um, is there a question that I should have asked, but I didn't with regard to curiosity in our development? Um. Uh, I guess you could say, I mean, uh, one interesting question people are often put to me is, how do I raise a curious child? You know, or, or, or why am I curious? Was it something my parents did? And uh, that's a kind of interesting topic um, w that I cover in the book. And, and just very briefly, there are the kind of obvious things which are have um, books around the house. Um, I don't know if, if ebooks quite count. Uh, this is a, uh, one area where physical books have the edge over, over the digital version. Um, talk to your children about the world over, you know, when, when you, when you get the chance to sit down with them, you know, discuss things that, uh, that are going on, not just what's going on within the household, but what's going on out there, even though there's a lot of, uh, fairly depressing news out there at the moment. Um, but also, and this is a really important point, when they ask questions, don't just answer the question, but ask a question back. Uh, there's a really interesting study of households where they compared uh, children who had grown up to be curious to children who were lower in, in, in curiosity. And that's what they found. They found that the, the children who are particularly curious uh, where they sort of taped the conversations that they've been having with their parents, um, were engaged in conversations with their parents where they would ask questions of the parent and then the parent would kind of throw the question back to them, perhaps in a slightly different form. And the parent was not only engaging in the child's curiosity, but was also signalling to the child that it's okay to be curious because actually I don't know everything either. You know, and I think it's a pressure on parents sometimes to front up, to show, to, to show that they do know everything. And the parents would say, you know, it's all right not to know. I don't know either. So what do you think? Let's talk about this. Let's work that out. Uh, are the, the parents who raise curious kids? Uh, the, the, with regard to Einstein, the quote that I'm thinking of, which I'm going to completely mangle, is that if you, you know, the best trait that you can inspire in your kids is um, curiosity. And the way to do that is to tell them stories. And the way to do it even more is to tell them even more stories. Yeah, the more stories, the better. Um, and uh, I, the opening uh, quote in my book, it's from Einstein, who said, I have no special talents. I am only passionately curious. 
Of course, I don't believe him for a minute, but um, it's a lovely thought. Uh, he also, Einstein also says, it's a miracle that curiosity survives formal education, um, which again, you'd kind of think to yourself, mm, yeah, you're gilding the lily a little bit on that one. Um, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, that's, the, that's the last question that I have. Um, where can the listeners of this podcast find you? Well, I am. Uh, I have a website, ian-leslie.com. Um, we're just about to revamp it. Um, I'm also on Twitter at Mr. Ian Leslie. Uh, so uh, if you want to follow me there, that's probably the best place to to keep up with what's going on. And of course, life. and of course, the book is on Amazon as well. And the book is on Amazon, exactly. All right, Ian. Let's end here. Um, thank you very much for your time and your insight. I, I really enjoyed this. Um, it's just such a fascinating topic. Good, good. And I really enjoyed talking to you. So thank you very much for, for having me on, on the podcast. All right, great. We'll talk to you again sometime soon. Thanks, Steve. Bye now. Bye. This has been Intangibles, a podcast created by Antecedent Ventures. Find out more at www.antecedent.vc. I'd like to thank Denton's Venture Technology Group at dentonsventurebeyond.com for being the sponsor this season and a supportive partner. Operating as a boutique within the world's largest law firm, the Venture Technology Group runs with hard-charging tech entrepreneurs to drive growth through strategic business, finance, and legal advice from Silicon Valley and New York to London, Berlin, Hong Kong, and beyond. Learn more at dentonsventurebeyond.com. I'd also like to thank Ben Glowey, who's been instrumental in helping me record and produce this season. I couldn't have done it without him. Find him on Twitter at visible underscore sound. And thank you. Keep an eye out for the next episode. And if you like this one, leave us a favorable review. I'm your host, Steve Burke.